In the vacuum left by the departing Soviets, the Mujahideen factions fought against the ailing central government, which finally collapsed in 1992. Hope for a new central government was short-lived as the seven major Mujahideen factions descended into a bitter civil war for control of the country. One of these factions, the Taliban, arose in 1994 from a small group of Pashtun religious students in southern Afghanistan. Under the leadership of the one-eyed cleric, Mullah Muhammad Omar, the Taliban became a popular movement, railing against the brutal excess of the rival warlords and the spread of the opium trade. In 1996, Osama bin Laden returned to Afghanistan. He brought with him a cadre of Al-Qaeda fighters and soon attracted many Afghan Arab veterans. As a gift to Mullah Omar, bin Laden donated vehicles, built roads, and recruited the largest jihadist army of modern times, Al-Qaeda's Brigade 055. The brigade was deployed against the Shura Nazar, or the Northern Alliance, of the anti-Taliban military groups. Two days before the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the leader of the Northern Alliance, Ahmad Shah Massoud, was assassinated in his headquarters in the Panjshir Valley in a suicide bombing by two Al-Qaeda terrorists posing as journalists. Al-Qaeda had eliminated the United States' closest ally in Afghanistan. In the aftermath of 9-11, America received pledges of military support from many nations. On September 12th, for the first time in history, NATO invoked Article 5 of its founding charter providing for mutual protection of member states against attack. Immediately after the September 11th attacks, there was great sympathy for the United States around the world. Um, a lot of personal, political, all kinds of sympathy. And uh, some of it had practical political implications. At the United Nations Security Council, for example, there was almost immediately a resolution that authorized essentially self and collective defense against these attacks. And NATO, for the first time in its history, invoked Article 5 of its charter, which um, was basically the right to collective defense, which meant that one member state had been attacked, so all the other member states would agree to provide resources to come to its defense. Right? It's kind of remarkable because NATO was created with the idea that the U.S. would come to the defense of Western Europe, but the first actual invocation of the treaty was the European allies saying they would come to the defense of the U.S. who had been attacked by this ambiguous uh, you know, non-state force. I mean, the, the whole alliance had been created with the idea that it would be the Soviet threat and its allies that would attack. Um, so uh, um, I think basically NATO has made good on the promise that it made almost immediately after the attack. I mean, within um, days, if not hours, that uh, this was a clear violation of the NATO charter. The sta a member state had been under attack. And, and even though it wasn't the government of Afghanistan per se that had attacked the United States, essentially the uh, government of Afghanistan, the Taliban, had allowed the attack to emanate from there. So the reason why NATO states are in Afghanistan is because the, the, the treaty allows it, they voted to do it, and uh, I think that they basically agreed with the idea of the war. Um, it, it was not at all the same with Iraq, where many of the, of the state members, like Germany and France, uh, were reluctant. I mean, they, they agreed with that policy, they disagreed with the other policy. Our NATO allies said this was an in injunction of Article 5, uh, that an attack on one member of the alliance is uh, you know, an attack on all and, and, and justifies a military response. Um, Again, it's a more complicated situation than other wars because you have this one initiated by a non-state actor, in effect. Yes, the Taliban had sanctuary in Afghanistan, but it wasn't the government of Afghanistan that attacked anyone. That's what's made this conflict so complicated now, uh, in that you have terrorists as non-state actors um, conducting warfare, and that's uh, very different from what we faced in the past. But if you look at the response of the Allies to Afghanistan and their response to Iraq, that's where you can see that uh, apparently they, they didn't have the same sort of emotional uh, investment in it that the Bush administration did. They were not convinced that it was worth uh, you know, a campaign against Iraq. On the other hand, Afghanistan clearly was. 
and that was, if you will, a just war. Uh, and they were willing to support it. This paved the way for NATO participation and deployment of troops in Afghanistan. The first step in reducing the terror threat would be to eliminate al-Qaeda main bases in Afghanistan. For the U.S. and its allies, planning for a new operation, at first codenamed Infinite Justice, faced a number of obstacles. Afghanistan had the look of a quagmire. After its 1979 invasion, the Soviet Union was ensnared in a protracted, ultimately unsuccessful war against the Afghan Mujahideen. Afghanistan was landlocked, meaning there was no easy access from the sea. Afghanistan's rugged terrain was home to about 25 million people, many of them sympathetic to Islamic extremists. Ten years of war with the Soviet Union left the country in the hands of tribal warlords who fought amongst themselves and sucked others into their disputes. In this setting, the Taliban initially attracted public support because it pledged to halt the fighting, end corruption, and build a pure Islamic state. The actual result was oppression, austerity, and the decay of basic government functions. Women were forced to wear the all-concealing burqa, and soccer stadium executions and amputations terrorized citizens. Although the Taliban in 2001 controlled about 80% of Afghan territory, Afghanistan was not at peace. By one estimate, 76,000 people died as a result of internal fighting between 1992 and 2000. As many as two and a half million Afghan refugees were living in Pakistan. The Afghan military had once been well equipped with Soviet tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery, rocket launchers, and short-range surface-to-surface missiles. As many as 100 MiG-21s and MiG-23s remained in Afghanistan, as did assorted armed and utility helicopters. SA-2 and SA-3 surface-to-air missiles, plus an unknown number of Stingers, SAM-7s and SAM-14s rounded out the inventory. Much of this equipment was old and in serious disrepair. It was difficult to estimate exactly what sort of resistance the Taliban could muster. The primary opposition to Taliban rule came from the Northern Alliance, a loose coalition of irregular forces under the leadership of Ahmad Shah Massoud, a charismatic and highly innovative guerrilla leader, former Afghan President Burhanuddin Rabbani, and General Abdul Rashid Dostum, leader of the National Islamic Movement. The Taliban controlled most major cities, but the mountains belong to factions of the Northern Alliance. In the summer of 2000, a major Taliban offensive had put pressure on Massoud, but the so-called Lion of the Panjshir was able to resist and survive. Battle lines in Afghanistan were never permanent. Smaller groups often switched loyalties back and forth between the Northern Alliance and the Taliban. Inserting any U.S. military forces into the region would require cooperation from Afghanistan's neighbors. They were a complicated group. Afghanistan bordered nations whose names must have made planners shudder. China, Iran, the now independent republics of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and on-again, off-again U.S. ally, Pakistan. Washington was lucky in two respects. First, many important regional actors had an interest in smacking Muslim extremists. China and Pakistan were worried about the emergence of radical Islamic groups within their borders. Uzbekistan was already dealing with its own insurgent terrorist group, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, whose leader, Juma Namagoni, threatened to launch a holy war against Uzbekistan's government. In 1999, the threat to the region was such that Russia first began hosting a counter-terrorism exercise, codenamed Southern Shield. Included were forces of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. 
Additionally, France, China, and Turkey were sending aid to the region. Second, the U.S. military had been running small exercises in the region since the late 1990s. In 2000, the U.S. provided $10 million in aid to Uzbekistan border units battling terrorism and the drug trade. A thin network of mutual interest was already in place, and the horror of September 11th strengthened it enough to provide a basis for planning. The first U.S. ground forces to set foot inside Afghanistan did so 15 days after 9-11. This small team, codenamed Jawbreaker, was inserted covertly from the former Soviet airbase Karshi Khandabad in Uzbekistan, where a formidable U.S. presence was building. The Jawbreaker force landed in the Panjshir Valley in a Russian-built but CIA-operated Mi-17 helicopter in the pre-dawn darkness of September 26th. The eight men in the team were not members of any military unit, but of the Central Intelligence Agency Paramilitary Special Activities Division and Counter-Terrorist Center. To the men of the Special Forces, they would be known colloquially by the acronym OGA, Other Government Agency. Consisting of former special operators, communications and linguistics experts, the team brought with them satellite communications, enabling their ground truth intelligence reports to be available instantly to headquarters staff at Langley and Central Command, CENTCOM, the military command responsible for Operation Enduring Freedom, the code name for the forthcoming U.S. coalition operations in Afghanistan. Jawbreaker also carried $3 million in U.S. currency in non-sequential $100 bills. These funds were used to shore up Northern Alliance support to OEF. The Jawbreaker team facilitated the planned insertion of the 1st U.S. Army Special Forces detachments with Northern Alliance commanders. They also provided bomb damage assessments for the coming air campaign. The September 11, 2001 terror attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. changed forever the way Americans viewed national security. For the United States Air Force and its partners in joint air power, the attacks and resulting global war on terrorism also erased distinctions between fighting over there and the defense of the United States. American strategy would be affected for decades to come. The large-scale U.S. response to an act of terrorism was a first for the American military. Operation Enduring Freedom, the U.S. overseas response, was in its most intense phase in the period October 2001 through January 2002, but it was not a massive air war. The sortie count from its start on October 7th through the final takeover of Afghan cities was half that of Operation Allied Force in 1999 and nowhere near the effort of the Gulf War in 1991. Air Force pilots flew some of the longest missions in history, but the success of the campaign was never seriously in question. What made enduring freedom unique was that in a war unlike any other, joint air power was able to respond on command in a harsh and politically complex environment. They conducted a campaign that initially filled the pundits with doubts, but they made it look routine, adapting to tactical constraints and bringing precise firepower to bear wherever needed despite the obstacles. Operation Enduring Freedom began officially on the evening of October 6, 2001, with Operation Crescent Wind, the coalition air campaign targeting Taliban command and control and air defense facilities. The Combined Air Operations Center for OEF was based at McGill Air Force Base, Florida. In October 2001, it generated an air tasking order that saw the beginning of a bombing campaign against Afghanistan in retaliation for the attacks on the United States. The B-2A Spirit earned a place in the record books for the longest non-stop combat mission ever 
which lasted in excess of 40 hours. They carried weapons loads that included 2,000 pound Joint Direct Air Munitions, or JDAMs. JDAM is a guidance kit that converts unguided bombs, or dumb bombs, into all-weather smart munitions. JDAM equipped bombs are guided by an integrated inertial guidance system coupled to a global positioning system receiver, giving them a published range of up to 15 nautical miles. The JDAM was meant to improve upon laser-guided bombs and imaging infrared technology, which can be hindered by bad ground and weather conditions. The big problem with our operations today is not that we can't hit what we're aiming at. It's that we aim at the wrong thing. So the problem is an intelligence problem. And if there's one thing in Washington that's worse organized than air power, it's intelligence. With a long transit time to Afghanistan from the Spirit's home base at Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, the V-2s often took off without having a target assigned to them. As they approached Afghanistan, Targets were passed to them via E-3 Sentry AWACS. Targets ranged from terrorist training facilities, the Taliban's few radar units and airfields, to command and control facilities. For all the B-2's state-of-the-art technology, human error can sometimes wreck even the best mission scenario. I remember when we sent a B-2 across the top of a building in Belgrade during the Kosovo, Great Kosovo campaign, it dropped four 2,000-pound bombs on a building. Three of them hit it. That's amazing. One of them hit the sidewalk right in front of the building. That's amazing. The building was supposed to be the, the uh, Milosevic's party headquarters. That's what the CIA said when they gave it to the Air Force as a target. Turned out it was the Chinese embassy. Luckily, there were only two Chinese nationals in there, I think janitors or something, because it was at night. The B-2 represents some of the most modern stealth technology in a manned operational aircraft. As the F-117 Nighthawk design bears the hallmarks of the 1970s technology, the smooth, clean lines of the B-2 are the products of the extremely powerful computers and software that were available a decade later. It is the aircraft's flying wing design itself that gives the B-2 its first level of radar avoidance and a reduced infrared signature. Most of the Taliban's aging SA-2 and SA-3 SAMs, along with their attendant radar and command units, were destroyed on the first night of operations, as were their small fleet of MiG-21 and Su-22 aircraft. While the B-2 struck the most important Taliban targets early on, conventional forces formed the backbone of OEF. With the threat of high-altitude SAMs negated and total air dominance quickly established, aerial targeting soon focused on Taliban infrastructure, leadership and troop targets, as well as known Al-Qaeda facilities. These targets were struck by a range of U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, United States Marine Corps, and British RAF aircraft types, F-16 Fighting Falcons, F-A-18 Hornets, B-1B Lancer, B-52H Stratofortresses, F-15 Eagles, and others all gathered in the crowded Afghan airspace as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda were driven to the mountains. The way was now clear for deployments on the ground. Under the overall leadership of General Tommy Franks, Coalition Forces Commander, four major task forces were initially dedicated to OEF. The Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, Combined Joint Task Force Mountain, the Joint Interagency Task Force Counterterrorism, and the Coalition Joint Civil Military Operation Task Force. The CJSOTF comprised three subordinate task forces, Task Force Dagger, Task Force K-Bar, and the secretive Task Force Sword, later Task Force 11. As the aerial campaign continued, 
Task Force Dagger was planning to insert their first teams into Afghanistan. Aviators from the 2nd Battalion of the Night Stalkers maintained their MH-47E Chinooks and the MH-601s on strip alert, awaiting a break in the bad weather to allow the helicopters to negotiate safely the notorious Hindu Kush mountains. After two weeks of preparatory aerial bombardment, the first two Special Forces ODA were infiltrated into Afghanistan in the evening and early hours of October 19, 2001. The first team to touch down was the 12-man ODA 555, who linked up with Jawbreaker in the Panjshir Valley and was taken to a safe house of a local warlord. They began operations alongside the Northern Alliance forces the very next day. The weather that night had been dangerous enough to force the two escort Blackhawks carrying a second team to turn back. Meanwhile, in southern Afghanistan, another special operation was underway. Some 200 Army Rangers from 3rd Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, with the 23rd Special Tactics Squadron, conducted a combat drop onto a remote airstrip southwest of the city of Kandahar. Preceded by a small Army Pathfinder team, the Rangers met minimal Taliban resistance. The location, codenamed Objective Rhino, was quickly secured. The Ranger mission also paved the way for the later use of the airstrip as forward operating base Rhino by the Marines of 15th MEU. While Task Force Sword carried out the Kandahar raids, ODA 595 was striking up a productive relationship with Rebel General Dostum in the north. On October 20th, the team guided in the first JDAM from an orbiting B-52. The rebels were very impressed by the American firepower. If you've got a guy on the ground who's illuminating a target with a laser beam, and he can talk to you in real time, now there's two ifs in a row. Already this circuitry, the soldering in this circuit is getting a little flimsy. But that is a system that can work, and we've shown works pretty well, and is an excellent use of special forces, by the way, with moving targets. You don't need something like this. If it's a bridge, you know where the bridge, bridge not gonna move, okay? But if it's a mover, and you can get somebody to shine a light on it, then that's, and, and he's in real time contact with somebody who can pull a trigger, that's good, that's okay. Not quite the tight, as tight as you'd like it, but it's pretty tight. The ODA 595 Bravo team was coordinating their own airstrikes in the Dari Asuf Valley, cutting off and destroying Taliban reinforcements and frustrating their attempts to relieve their embattled forces in the north. For airmen, the war shifted rapidly from strikes against pre-planned targets to a combination of pre-planned and flexible targets. As emerging targets came to dominate the tasking, the key was to keep fighters and bombers on station over Afghanistan long enough to get good targets for their weapons. To cope with these requirements, Navy aircraft carriers worked under a new and different kind of operational concept in the Afghan air war. Previously, exercises focused on a single carrier generating combat power, a reflection of the Cold War emphasis on each carrier being able to survive and operate alone. Enduring Freedom saw several aircraft carriers combining forces to generate the required effort. The USS Enterprise was joined by four more carriers. The USS Kitty Hawk shed all but eight strike aircraft from the air wing to make room on the deck for Special Operation Forces helicopters. Once on station, the air component became a roving strike force, positioned over the battle space to provide prompt, precise firepower on demand. For the fighters, including land-based Air Force fighters launched from the Gulf region, a standard mission was to take off and fly to an assigned engagement zone. The fighters might orbit, waiting on the most recent information synthesized from a variety of sources to be passed on to the strike aircraft. We have five air forces now. 
But there are 16 intelligence agencies that all have to be coordinated, all with various pieces of the elephant that they have a grasp on. And we established a, a national intelligence office that's supposed to coordinate all that that's so far been a massive flop, as near as I can tell. By intelligence, I mean where's the target? For an airman, the intelligence of interest is where's the target? Now, there's a lot of other kinds of intelligence, but it's mostly cocktail party conversation. You know, who's sleeping with who? is not a big interest to an airman. What he wants to know is what is the target? Where is it located? That's intelligence. The main obstacle for continuous fighter coverage was distance. The need to fly more than 500 miles inland, strike and recover within the intricate deck cycle time of the carrier's operations created a major challenge. Bombers suffered less from range limitations and soon shouldered the major part of the job. After the initial two days of strikes, the B-2s were not used again. Since the air defenses in Afghanistan did not pose a threat to conventional bombers, if they stayed above the altitudes for such man-portable SAMs and anti-aircraft fire as might be left. But other bombers were cast in starring roles. 18 B-52s and B-1s deployed forward to Diego Garcia. Typically, officers in the Combined Air Operations Center could count on four sorties per day from the B-1s and five from the B-52s. Both the B-1 and B-52 now carry GPS-guided joint direct attack munitions. For the first time in combat, these bombers followed the lead of the B-2s in Allied Force in 1999 and linked into the new net of updated information to take new target coordinates in real time. Bombers generally did not have their entire load of weapons designated for fixed targets. Instead, bomber crews headed for their first pre-planned targets and then were on call to be redirected to other targets. While U.S. Air Force bombers and Navy fighters were shifting gears, another very unusual type of air war was just getting underway. A clandestine air war used unmanned vehicles, satellites, and other intelligence sources to track time-sensitive targets, of which the most tempting and critical were the Taliban and Al-Qaeda officials on the campaign's most wanted list. Time-sensitive targeting could be used for attacking any moving or movable target of high importance, especially one that through electronic emissions, communications, or other telltale signs, gave only brief, elusive indications of its location. There was another twist. In February 2001, the Air Force had successfully test-fired Hellfire missiles from a Predator Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, or UAV. The CIA appropriated the capability and used predators to fire at, as well as track, key targets in Afghanistan. The targeting of these time-sensitive targets, no matter how exciting, had to conform to the laws of war as dictated by the Geneva Conventions. Strict adherence to the rules of war served to eliminate any possibility of being justifiably accused as a war criminal down the road. No commander wanted to be caught out attacking a carload full of Afghan civilians when the target was Al-Qaeda fighters. Restaurants, private homes, civilian-style vehicles all posed nightmarish ID problems, especially under time pressures. Yeah, you know, we, we have had some unfortunate incidents of fratricide, especially in uh, Afghanistan where, you know, the the stories about wedding parties being bombed and so on are un unhappily uh, too familiar. But, um, you know, in those cases, we hit what we were aiming at. We just aimed at the wrong thing. And it's hard to describe that as an improvement, but our, our, our use of munitions heretofore has had has sort of randomness about it. That, uh, that's just unbearable. Target approval remained a delicate process throughout Enduring Freedom, 
giving rise to speculative press stories about who grants approval and why and how often authorization was held back. The need for target approval by Franks and levels above him sometimes slowed the campaign. A pilot, whatever else you say about him, pilots are the product of unskilled labor, okay? You can get them, you can hire them a dime a dozen off the sidewalk. Now it takes a million dollars to train them, <laughs> but uh, they're motivated to come back. And I never met a UAV that had motivations, <laughs> you know? The Taliban began to withdraw towards Mazar al Sharif with ODA 595 Alpha Team following, pausing only to direct further air support. On November 10th, Mazar al Sharif fell to the Alliance, providing the first hint that the war might not be the year long effort predicted by the Pentagon. Three days after the fall of Mazar al Sharif, Kabul was captured by General Fahim Khan and the men of ODA 555. Surviving Taliban and Al-Qaeda retreated towards Kandahar and Tora Bora. Civil affairs teams and tactical PSYOP teams immediately deployed into Afghanistan to assist in winning the hearts and minds of the inhabitants. It was kind of cool when we got there and we actually got off of the plane and we're standing in Afghanistan looking around seeing the mountains. It was just kind of a surreal and unreal kind of, kind of feeling because it was something like I said, we'd all thought about and kind of built up in our head, and then now here we are, we have the chance to do it, and we're you know, on the ground right here getting ready to do something that's gonna change our lives and hopefully change the lives of a lot of other people as well. The American assistance was well received by the liberated villagers. I think we were, we were uh, exceptionally um, accepted a lot more. We were, um, welcomed with a little more open arms. They were very aware of the job we were there to do. They uh, acknowledged the fact that we were here to help them and to give them something back to teach them more of what they could do for themselves. Most of the assistance was agricultural or medical. We mainly wanted to um, focus on working and empowering the Afghan government, Jairoa. Um, so that the citizens of Afghanistan knew that their government was working for them. We were stationed at Bagram Airfield and our air of operations was Bamiyan, Parwan, Panjshir, and Kapisa. Um, that's north of Kabul. Um, so four provinces, it was a, it was a huge area. Um, and they would teach um, different techniques on how to grow crops, um, e how to irrigate uh, more proficiently. Um, we did tractor training to teach them how to farm the land with a tractor and um, basically just try to make them more proficient in their agriculture skills um, through the the government and they had a uh, it's called a Dale the director of irrigation agriculture and livestock um, and we would work with him who would have extension agents that were spread out through the provinces and then they would teach the farmers so they knew that the the government was working for them and it wasn't just coalition forces I actually got to participate in a, um, it was a medical aid station type thing uh, that was set up in a village right outside of our base um, where it was myself and two other medical providers where we went out and just set up a clinic basically inside a school that wasn't being used and we saw, it was over three days and we started at you know, seven in the morning and went till five in the evening and we just saw all of the villagers. I mean, they came from not only the village that we were working in, um, but for miles and miles around. They would walk, caravan in, however they could get there, just to be seen by some sort of medical person um, because of their health care in those villages are pretty much non-existent. Um, so for me, that was a very gratifying thing. Being a medic, I felt like I actually got to take my knowledge and help you know, children, the women would come in, um, the village elders would come in, um, just for anything from, you know, a bruise, a cut, you know, a broken tooth, runny nose, anything like that. 
So them coming in to see us and then leaving with a smile on their face and telling us thank you uh, for providing something that they don't get on a day-to-day -day basis like we have was probably one of my proudest moments uh, during the deployment. The civil affairs team was always aware that their brothers were still in the fight. Every day you think about, yes, here we are in this completely new and completely different country from what we're used to seeing, but it's completely, totally beautiful. Um, and you're, but you're very aware of, yes, we may not be actually fighting right this second, but there's other soldiers and other friends of ours that are in other areas that are most likely fighting every day, every minute, every hour. As the cities fell in rapid succession, Task Force Dagger's attention became focused on the last Northern Taliban stronghold, Kanduz. ODA 586 used massive airstrikes to demoralize the Taliban defenders, and after 11 days of continual aerial bombardment, the Taliban asked for terms, officially surrendering on November 23rd. On November 25th, Another forward operating base near Kandahar added more pressure on the beleaguered Taliban. The Marines sent in the 15th MEU, which was soon reinforced by the newly arrived Australian SASR squadron. Hamid Karzai began moving on Kandahar with ODA 574, gathering fighters among local Pashtuns, until the militia eventually numbered 800. On December 7th, the Marines and Karzai's militia accepted the surrender of the Taliban in Kandahar. The campaign had taken just under two months, 49 days from the insertion of the first ODA teams to the fall of Kandahar. It was accomplished by several hundred SOF and perhaps 100 OGA, supported by their determined allies of the Northern Alliance and the awe-inspiring might of U.S. air power. After the fall of Kabul, Al-Qaeda elements allegedly including bin Laden and other leadership figures withdrew to the eastern city of Jalalabad, capital of Nangahar province. Jalalabad was only a short distance from Tora Bora, the network of cave systems and defenses developed by the Mujahideen during their war against the Soviet occupiers. Tora Bora lies in the White Mountains only 12 miles from the border, where a crossing point at Parashanar leads into Pakistan's northwest frontier province. The area was familiar to bin Laden, he knew that the mountain caverns would provide the perfect stronghold, one that the Soviets had never managed to fully conquer. Coalition signals and human intelligence suggested that significant numbers of Al-Qaeda fighters and possible high-value targets were moving from Jalalabad to take refuge in Tora Bora. Due to resistance from higher echelons, a decision was made to attack Tora Bora using special operations forces supporting local militia. Eventually, some 3,000 Afghan militia forces, paid for by the CIA, were recruited for the operation to isolate and destroy Al-Qaeda elements using Tora Bora as a sanctuary. The leader of the CIA jawbreaker team requested the third of the 75th Rangers to act as stop groups along escape routes from Tora Bora, but the JSOC commander denied the request. U.S. Marine Corps General James Mattis believed that using rangers to seal the trails might have succeeded. Advised by special ops units, the militias started to make some progress, but on December 12th, Mohammed Zaman opened negotiations with the Al-Qaeda forces in Tora Bora. Much to the frustration of the SOF, a truce was called until 8 a.m. the next morning to allow Al-Qaeda forces time to agree to surrender amongst themselves. This appears to have been a ruse. Several hundred Al-Qaeda members, including men of Brigade 055, escaped during the night along the mountain paths toward Pakistan. 
It has also been alleged that members of the CIA-funded militias acted as guides for bin Laden. Rumor indicates that bin Laden paid 46 million U.S. dollars for the help. By the end of 2001, Afghanistan was in coalition and rebel hands. But few realized at the time that 10 years later, U.S. soldiers and Marines would still be bleeding in the mountain nations.